The Office of Bilingual Education and World Languages of the New York State Education Department presents this next workshop in its 2022 professional learning series, Assessment Part 2, Creating Formative and Summative Performance Assessment Tasks. This webinar is offered free of charge for world language educators and administrators working and studying in New York State education institutions. Our workshop description is as follows. What is a performance task? What role do performance tasks play in both instruction and assessment in a standards-based thematic unit? In this session, participants will learn characteristics of performance tasks and how they differ from exercises and activities. Participants will examine and analyze model performance tasks. Presenters will share guidance for creating and using performance tasks as one part of a complete assessment plan. Our workshop presenters today are Dr. Joanna O'Toole, Dr. Lori Langer de Ramirez, and Bill Heller. Without further ado, it's my pleasure to invite Joanne, Lori, and Bill to begin this workshop. So welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, to, today's, assess, uh, today's session is entitled Assessment Part Two, and hopefully you were able to join us for Assessment Part One, but not that was recorded and will be made available to you in the near future. Our focus today is on creating formative and summative performance assessment tasks. So just a reminder that we have two more webinars this fall. Lesson planning part one from unit plan to lesson plans, putting the pieces together. And that is November 1st. I don't know why that didn't show up on our slide. My apologies. November 1st from 4 to 5 p.m. And then lesson planning part two lesson planning options for thematic units on Tuesday, December 13th, 4 to 5 p.m. Again, all sessions are recorded and CTLE credits are available to those who attend live or who complete our assessments that are online with the recordings. And we also invite you, if you haven't already registered for it, for our election day event, which is an 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. workshop where um, you may sign up as a department or as individuals. And we'll be putting this link into the chat. It's also on the State Ed webpage. And six and a half hours of CTLE credits will be made available to you. So our webinar symbol keys are the ones you regularly see. Um, just a reminder to maintain your microphone muted. You'll see that blue thought bubble when we ask you to think alone. And when we ask that, please don't enter into the chat. Just simply think about what we're asking. Writing in the chat box is only when we show you that icon. So we do ask that you not enter anything into the chat throughout our session so as to not distract the audience except when you have a question that you hope we'll be able to answer. That said, we will not be answering questions until the end of today's session. And we have a Google folder. Bill has already put the link into the chat and he will continue to do so at various points in today's session. And so if you see that folder icon, that means that what we're showing you on the screen will be available to you in that folder. So let's get started. Oh, here's another link to that handouts folder, or you can simply scan the QR code if you choose. We have five goals for today's session, starting with, I can identify the elements of the world language assessment continuum. Second, I can identify the features of performance tasks and number three, I can identify types of performance tasks and how to assess them. Fourth, I can identify the place of performance tasks in the instruction assessment and feedback process. And finally, I can analyze sample performance tasks within a thematic unit. So we assess all the time in our world language classrooms. And so what I want to propose to you is that the various types of assessments that we use are really on a continuum. And the continuum starts 
with comprehension checks. And I'm defining comprehension checks is those informal immediate probes, did they understand? Also, formative assessments. These are the assessments that we can carry out informally or formally, and that they measure the learning that is in progress. They give feedback to us about our teaching so we can make adjustments and feedback to our learners about how they're progressing through their learning. We also have our summative assessments, those formal assessments that we use to measure the learning that our students have already achieved. And finally, on the continuum are our proficiency assessments. These are those benchmark assessments that happen at the end of a given checkpoint, like a checkpoint A assessment, a checkpoint B assessment. And these are assessments that are intended to simulate real world use of the target language. And this whole continuum of world language assessments are ideally helping know where our students are relative to their proficiency development and simultaneously promoting their proficiency development. So we're going to take another look at these at this continuum of world language curricular assessments because even though what I'm calling it a continuum, it is actually multiple continua. So moving from left to right from those comprehension checks to proficiency assessments, we're moving our students from that initial point of learning to post learning. We're moving from those very specific lesson can do statements to simulated real world communication. We're moving from what is really very teacher directed to learner directed as our students are engaged in, in their proficiency oriented communication. And finally, from that very discrete content, where did they understand what this meant to the integrated content where they're putting concepts and language together in complex and sophisticated ways. So that performance task, what is it? Well, I'm going to start by sharing with you four criteria. A performance task is first, something that resembles a real world activity. It has a primary focus on meaning. And it has a non linguistic outcome. In other words, it's meaningful communication, not practice of a particular linguistic focus. And finally, it expects the learners to use their own linguistic resources. So when we think back to our continuum of assessments, we can use performance tasks at the formative assessment level, the summative assessment level, and for proficiency assessments. So I'm going to share with you three different can do statements. And of course, it's the can do statement that we are assessing. So I want you to consider these three, and then I'm going to ask you to think about some questions. So sample A, I can conjugate regular present tense verbs. Sample B, I can express a restaurant preference using regular present tense verbs. Or C, I can express a restaurant preference. So here are my questions. Compare and contrast again, just in your own mind, those three can do statements. Which one or ones can be carried out through performance tasks, keeping in mind the definition that I just shared with you?
So we're going to come back to these in a moment and you can compare your answers to the ones that I share. So again, the starting place for performance tasks is with that standards based can do statement. And you've seen this over and over again as you've attended our various webinars. A standards based can do statement starts with the words I can, followed by a language function and in a context, a meaningful context. So breaking that down a little bit, our language function is standards informed. You want to remember that each one of our five learning standards incorporates one or more language functions. So you're beginning with a language function associated with one of the five standards. And of course, it's in that meaningful communicative context that's been informed by our New York State World Language Themes and Topics. And it is assessed, it is carried out and assessed through the performance task. So let's go back and look at those three can do statements again. Can do statement A, students will be able to conjugate regular present tense, oh, that should have the word verbs. So is there a standard informed language function? I don't think so. Does it have a meaningful context? Nope, no context. So can it be carried out through a possible performance task? No, because of course, the can do statement doesn't lead to a performance task. So what we're looking at here is what's referred to as an exercise. And an exercise is used for language practice. And when it's used for language practice, it has no attention to a communicative purpose or a meaning based context. So we're going to look at can do statement B. I can express a restaurant, a restaurant preference using regular present tense, regular present tense verbs. So does it have a standard informed language function? Yes, it does. I'm expressing a preference and expressing preferences goes right along with interpersonal communication. Is there a meaningful context? Well, yes, there is. I'm expressing that preference in regard to a rest, which is a meaningful context. But is there a possible performance task here? And an activity is another form of language practice. And in this case, the language practice is done with secondary attention to the communicative purpose and a meaning based context. Because notice how the focus is really on using the regular present tense. It's not focusing on, it doesn't have a non linguistic focus. So now look, let's look at can do statement C. I can express a restaurant preference. So does it have a standards informed language function? Absolutely. In a meaningful context? Oh, yes. And is there a possible performance task? Yes, there is. Because this is a performance task. And the performance task is a communicative act where the primary attention is on the communicative purpose in the meaning based context. And here the student can express their own meaning. They're not bound by a given structure in expressing that meaning. So thinking about I can express a restaurant preference. Does it resemble a real world activity? Absolutely. Is the primary focus on meaning? Yes, it is. Does it have a non-linguistic outcome? Absolutely. And are the learners 
learners expected to use their own linguistic resources? Yes, they are. So you may be wondering, what is the place of exercises and activities? So exercises, remember the conjugate the present tense verb, they don't provide meaningful input or opportunities for meaningful output. They may provide reinforcement of the language structures, in this case, present tense, and therefore they may be best reserved for brief use in a lesson or for use outside of the communicative classroom. Let's take a look at the activities. They may provide some meaningful input and opportunities for meaningful output. And they may also connect language structures to language functions, because we know that the purpose of the structures is to carry out the language functions. And so they may also serve as scaffolds to performance tasks. And they can be converted into performance tasks with a shift in focus from language practice to a communicative act. So I want to point out that I've introduced the idea of the place of exercises and activities and shown them in relation to performance tasks. And a little bit later in today's session, Bill Heller is going to talk more about exercises and activities. So what are some types of performance tasks? Well, I'm going to share with you three different performance tasks. And there is one associated with each of our communication standards. So the first one, an input-based performance task, is specific to the interpretive mode of communication, as you can see by our little icon, where those errors, arrows are pointing in to the learner. And remembering that the interpretive communication um, standard says learners interpret meaning from print, audio, signed, or visual texts and have access to the language that they need. So I always start with a can-do statement. So here's my interpretive can-do statement. I can determine and notice the words in blue are my language functions. I can determine target culture dishes that meet others' dietary needs and preferences. So a performance task, an interpretive performance task that would emerge from that can-do statement might be, in planning a target culture-inspired meal for classmates, you view cooking videos to identify dishes with ingredients that meet your classmates dietary needs and preferences. So I've got my can do statement. I've got my performance task. So what does it look like when my students are carrying it out? So the first thing I keep in mind is they're watching videos. So I want to make sure my task design is appropriate to my students proficiency level and to the type of resource that I'm using. So videos go kind of fast and maybe my students can view them more than once or maybe they can pause them. But I want to make sure that I choose um, a task design that would work well with a video. And the task has students identifying dishes with ingredients that meet cla meets classmates dietary needs and preferences. So I'm going to look at all my different interpretive task designs and you do have this in your folder. And I identify a few I think would work well for this purpose. So I might have my students match ingredients that they hear about in the videos to dietary needs and preferences. 
I might have a checklist where I have a different dietary need and preference and they check off the ones named and, and that match um, the needs and preferences. Or I might have a graphic organizer like a T-chart or something. So I have some choices I might make. So in the output-based performance tasks, I have two different modes of communication, starting with interpersonal. And remembering that the interpersonal communication standard says that learners express meaning. Well, that wasn't exactly what I wanted to put on on that slide, but in the in the interpersonal mode, they're expressing meaning and creating with language. That's not actually the standard, which I had hoped to put up there. Sorry about that. But anyways, I'm going to start with my can do statement. And in blue, there's my language function so I can exchange information about target culture dishes to plan a menu that meets classmates dietary needs and preferences. So from that can do statement, I identify the interpersonal performance task. So after viewing cooking videos about target culture dishes, exchange information with a number another member of the planning committee to propose a menu for the target culture inspired inspired meal that includes dishes and that will meet classmates dietary needs and preferences. So we might perceive that different students are viewing different cooking videos and exchanging information, kind of an information gap activity. So I'm keeping in mind that my students are exchanging information and that they're going to be proposing a menu that meets classmates dietary needs and preferences and I consider the different interpersonal performance task designs and I identify a couple I think would work well for this performance task my students might carry out a conversation they might have an information gap activity and finally another output based um, task would be in the presentational mode. And again, this is where our students are expressing meaning and creating with language. My can do statement says I can inform and again, inform is their language function, others of a menu that meets their dietary needs and preferences. And so the performance task in anticipation of the class target culture inspired meal let your classmates know that you have taken their dietary needs and preferences into account by identifying the dishes chosen for the menu and explaining how they meet their needs. So I again look at my potential task designs. I think about the fact that they're informing classmates and they're explaining how the menu meets their dietary needs and preferences. And I decide there's really only one way to go, and that's going to be a communication, which in this case, I'll plan to have them write an email. And when I've designed my performance tasks, any of them that are formal in nature are ones where I would be choosing to use the rubrics the rubrics that we shared with you in um, our webinar on assessment number one, and also is found on the state ed webpage and in our folder. But that's for formal assessments. So if my tasks weren't formal in nature, um, formative in nature, I might not choose to use the rubric. I may use another way of evaluating my students' performances. But the rubrics are designed so that they're appropriate to the performance tasks at the various proficiency levels. But some of you may have been thinking, but what if I want my students to use a particular language structure? while they're communicating. Think about those present tense verbs. So let me share with you two different types of performance tasks. They're called unfocused and focused. The unfocused performance task 
is where there's no linguistic focus in the task design. That's the one that we looked at previously, review a restaurant on Yelp. Nowhere in that does it tell the students to use any particular uh, linguistic structure, nor does it even suggest it. Whereas focus tasks strongly suggest a particular linguistic focus. For example, review a restaurant on Yelp in which you make recommendations to the readers of the review. Making recommendations, we have a language function and it's a language function that is carried out with particular structures, structures that are used specifically for the purpose of making recommendations. And that you probably would have been recently teaching your students that would support them in carrying out the focus task. So the benefits of tasks are that in the classroom, they potentially include more student output, more student autonomy and involvement. And in addition, task-based interaction can help learners develop those communication skills that transfer outside of the classroom. So at this point, I am going to turn this over to my colleague, Bill Heller. Thank you, Joanne. So um, where do performance tasks fit in to our practice as we move into a proficiency oriented curriculum? So for a good part of my own practice, if you ask me to represent my understanding of instruction and assessment as I practiced it, it might look something like this. Instruction consisted of a series of lessons in which I led students through a sequentially ordered series of exercises and activities to develop vocabulary and grammar, moving from comprehension to production. And then at various times throughout the unit, I administer quizzes to serve as checks of mastery of vocabulary or structures. Toward the end of the chapter, I might assign a project attempting to link the topic with the targeted language structures, resulting in the creation of some kind of a product or performance. And then at the end of the unit, there'd be a unit exam, sometimes formatted after the proficiency or regents, often also containing sections to assess mastery of grammar and vocabulary. In this model that I that uh, I did, uh, feedback was usually done with my righteous red pen of correction. Sometimes I'd make comments, sometimes related to effort, sometimes related to progress, sometimes related to creativity. The brick walls you see represent that I often viewed the processes of instruction, assessment, and feedback as three separate processes or phases. And after the feedback, we moved on to the next unit. Moving from a skills-based understanding of language learning to a proficiency-based curriculum invites us to adopt a more recursive understanding of instruction, assessment, and feedback. Now instruction directed to target language functions centers on creating a sequence of opportunities for meaningful communication simulating real world contexts. As we've heard from Joanne, these are the performance tasks. We can still use a few strategically selected exercises and activities as scaffolds to prepare learners to engage in a series of performance tasks related to the inquiry question of our thematic unit. Engaging learners in performance tasks becomes the primary means and focus of instruction. And we know that it is in performance that leads to proficiency. Assessment, therefore, becomes a continuous and seamless part of instruction. The same performance tasks that are the basis of instruction 
can be instruments of assessment. In this model, performance tasks aligned with unit can do statements serve as a primary tool of both instruction and assessment. We might still use the occasional quizzes as retrieval practice to activate prior knowledge, to incorporate into a new context. And tests can still be strategically used as on-demand proficiency checks. One important advantage of using performance tasks is that it also provides rich opportunities for actionable feedback to help students grow in their proficiency. Feedback can be informal comments during instructional tasks or more formal through the use of proficiency focused rubrics. Well defined rubrics give the students a chance to engage in self assessment of their performance as well. When the instruction is largely comp comprised of a series of performance tasks, students have subsequent opportunities to incorporate feedback from previous tasks into subsequent performances. This feedback can make our assessment formative. End of unit or end of course performance tasks can be considered summative. Feedback from these assessments are more evaluative in nature and can be used to demonstrate progress over time, as well as provide directions for future learning. When I first started learning about performance tasks, I immediately thought, oh, I do that. I just call them projects. Over time, I began to see that my understanding of projects was much less specific than the qualities of true performance tasks. Here are some differences that I discovered in moving from projects to performance tasks. Projects are often content focused. They center around a culture topic or a set of vocabulary or you know, practicing a, a specific grammar structure like the food project or the, the clothing project. Whereas performance tasks are function focused. They target one or more of the standards. Projects were often skill focused. It was a reading task or it was a, a writing task um, or a speaking task, oftentimes presentational in nature, but not necessarily. Whereas performance tasks are standards based, they can be either interpretive, interpersonal or presentational. And one can be designed to lead into the next. The projects were often product focused create a collage, create a, a, a model, create a poster, create a video. It was focused on the project, on the product of, of that was produced. Whereas the performance tasks are always focused on what kind of communication results from it. What's the motive for communication? Projects were often been evaluated with checklists. Sometimes they were quantitative. We would count the number of usages of a certain structure or whether they followed all the specific directions that we had for the task. Whereas performance tasks are evaluated with proficiency oriented rubrics. Projects I, as I used them were always nearly, nearly always summative. They were at the end of the unit. Performance tasks can be summative or formative. And finally, projects oftentimes, as I had conceived them, were time consuming. And sometimes there was little target language use uh, for the time uh, amount of time that you spent on it. And sometimes also you, you would, the way the task was, the way the project was structured, it would kind of encourage kids to use translators and things like that, because it was sometimes above what the student's proficiency level allowed. Whereas performance tasks are really focused on where the student's proficiency is, they can be less time consuming as a result, and they can be designed to result in rich target language use. Many of my former projects took the creative imp impetus behind the project, and then I modified them to become more clearly standards focused on target language functions aligned to the standards. Laura will now show us a few examples of performance tasks and assessments. Thanks, Bill. So what role does assessment play 
in the proficiency focused standards based curriculum. I'm going to refer back, um, if you were with us for the, our last webinar on rubrics, you, um, ex we explored this unit. This is my unit on um, Colombia, um, the country of, of beautiful natural resources. Uh, we talked a little bit about some summative performance tasks. Right now we're going to focus on the part of the unit that really hones in on the flora and fauna of Colombia. We're gonna talk about animals and plants, mainly animals, and we're going to see several different performance tasks that come out in this part of this thematic unit. So first, as Joanne mentioned, in this continuum of performance tasks, we have a comprehension task, uh, a comprehension check. And Joanne said that these are informal, immediate probes. So students are going to be reading this infographic or this, this advertisement, actually. It's an interpretive reading task. They're going to read the infographic and give a thumbs up if the statements are true or a thumbs down if the statements are false. So this is an immediate check of comprehension. Notice the questions here are in English. And those are partly because um, of our uh, audience right now has multiple languages and some Spanish and some not, but also because in an interpretive reading um, performance task, you can make that choice to have the questions in English. Um, in our program, in my school, we would have these questions in Spanish because they have been studying for a while and can really uh, use that language and understand it. But that is a choice that you can make in the interpretive reading task because the focus really is on this infographic. So again, for those of you who don't speak Spanish, this infographic is talking about an app. You likely can pick that up just from the graphics. And we're asking, um, is this an app for your phone? So the answer is yes. There are new things available on the app. And so students, we would ask this question, they would say, yes, thumbs up to that. There are some new things on this app that this ad is sharing uh, and talking about. You can report animals that have been killed on the app. The answer is yes to that. And we're gonna find out a little bit more later about why this app exists. You cannot report live animals on the app. And that's a thumbs down. You can report both live and sadly animals that have been killed on the road on this app. And finally, this app helps with conservation efforts. And of course, that is starting to give students the idea of, of this portion of the unit. We're talking about animals and we're talking about conservation. So it really sets the scene. But as far as a performance task goes, this is a comprehension check, very quick, just a probe to see if students understood this authentic resource. So moving from here, we would look at a formative assessment. This is an interpretive reading task. This is uh, a text that is from um, Radio, uh, Radio Nacional in Colombia, and it is wonderfully connecting animals to the film Encanto. Remember at the end of this thematic unit, students will be viewing the film Encanto. And so this specifically takes the animals out of that film and gives a quick overview with some wonderful graphics and so this interpretive reading task is asking students to read the article about both the flora and fauna that appears in the film Encanto. And here's that language function that Bill, was, Bill and Joanne were both referencing. We're asking them to categorize their favorite, their second favorite, and their third favorite animals or plants. So as this is formative, I'm simply going to ask them to categorize and we might have students share out what their first, second, and third favorites are. And in our school, we have this gesture means me too, or yo también in my class. And so students might say, yep, yeah, that's my first, that's my second, that's my third favorite as well. The second part of this formative assessment is an interpersonal speaking task. And so using that same document, students will now get into groups and they're going to have a conversation. Again, that language function here is bolded they are going to exchange their preferences about their favorites and select one animal or plant to be the group's favorite. So you can see here, they've all had their favorite. They've all shared which one they like, maybe telling each other why they like that particular animal. And then they vote as a group 
And guess which animal is always the favorite in my sixth grade classes? It's the capybara inevitably wins hands down. Kids just love capybaras and so do I. So this is a formative assessment. Again, um, this is students talking and interpersonal speaking conversation and we'll have a vote. And so the entire class will vote and that's the way we assess whether or not students are comprehending and having um, a good robust conversation. And we'll come with a class favorite, which is always the capybara. And so let's, let's check, is this a performance task based on all of the uh, characteristics that Joanne and Bill were sharing earlier? So this, these tasks, do they resemble real world activities? In my class, absolutely. Students are talking about these animals, which ones they like, which ones they don't, whether we include it in my curriculum or not. So it is very, very real world to my students. So check for that one. It has a primary focus on meaning. So students are really discussing this content without anything guided or any reference to particular structures or vocab that they need to use. So it is absolutely focused on meaning. It has a non-linguistic outcome in this case to find out which is the class's favorite animal. And it expects students to use their own linguistic resources, however they can communicate to each other the feelings that they have about the different animals, what they like, what they dislike. It's coming from the resources that they have in their heads. So it's a performance task or a suite of performance tasks. From here, I'm gonna take a moment in my class to set some context and set the scene. Remember, we're going to be looking at the film Encanto. It's set in the coffee growing region. And so I share with students these photographs that I took in Colombia of uh, the Jeep Willys. The Jeep Willys is the vehicle of choice in this region of Colombia. And so we're going to have students climb into their Jeep Willys and we're gonna take a road trip. They're in the passenger seat and they're going to notice some road signs that they will see looking out the side of their willies. What do they think these road signs might mean? And so for the next task, this is again a formative assessment. It's interpretive reading or viewing. They're going to look at these authentic uh, photographs um, of road signs. And I'm asking students to list the animals that they see in a T-chart. Next to each animal's name, they're going to put a check mark if we have a similar animal in the United States. And in this case, they're going to see the tigrillo, um, which is the uh, like a small leopard. Um, they're going to see a fox and they're going to see an armadillo. And of course they check off those two that they are familiar with. So this is a formative assessment for interpretive reading or viewing. And then to build on that, we're going to look at this infographic. And this is an interpretive reading task. And now begins a summative assessment. So all of this was building an interpretive, um, all of a formative assessment. Now we're moving towards a summative, the summative component of these assessments uh, or these performance tasks. This is an interpretive reading one. They'll read this infographic and list additional animals. So the same T-chart from before, we're going to add to it. And here they see multiple animals on this visual. It's quite a stark visual and it's a visual that is fairly compelling to my sixth grade students. Um, sadly, this infographic is about roadkill in Colombia. And you saw that prefaced at the beginning when we were looking at that app. And this is a problem in Colombia, in the United States as well. Um, but here you see the, the real, uh, the numbers, by looking at the numbers, the real scope of the problem in Colombia versus the United States or Brazil. And so students are reading this infographic and they're adding animals to their chart for an interpretive reading task and that they might share out and we'll create a big list of all of the animals on the board that they've gleaned from these resources. Moving from this infographic or, or continuing with the infographic, I should say, they're going to have a conversation and here's an interpersonal speaking task. With the partner, they will exchange information. Again, here are our options about the highway or animal accidents in Colombia. We want them to talk about the question, does anything surprise you from this information? And we're asking them to express opinions about the information and about what might be done to help. Now I should 
let you know that this unit comes fairly deep into the school year for my sixth graders. And this entire year is focused on animals and conservation and the environment. And so they've had a lot of opportunity to discuss conservation, what we can do, how we can help. And so know that that has been swirling and has been building over time. Even still, they might need some scaffolding for this. They might need some language that we have on a word wall or we have some uh, sentence starters that can help get this sort of conversation going. So for this interpersonal speaking task, this performance task, they're going to be having conversations and because it is a summative assessment, I want to give feedback in, uh, in using rubrics, as we discussed in our last webinar. And so you can see the rubric that I designed using the, the uh, master rubrics that we shared along with the templates. And so it is specific to this particular performance task. After this conversation, there's going to be another piece to this performance task, again, a summative assessment. They will create a PSA or a public service announcement. This is a presentational writing task. We're going to ask them to tell the audience what to do and what not to do to keep animals safe on the highway. And as Joanne was mentioning earlier, this really suggests, this language these uh, language functions suggest a certain structure, right? So they'll be using likely commands, affirmative and negative commands, because that is what you would use in a real world situation when you're giving advice or telling someone what to do and what not to do. Again, for this performance task, I'm going to be using a rubric that I've constructed using the master rubrics and the templates able to pull out the pieces that I need for this particular task and put it into uh, the template. And here I have uh, the way to give feedback to my students for this summative assessment uh, for this performance task. And again, let's review. Let's see if these tasks fit the description of a performance task. So resembles a real world activity. Absolutely. There is an app designed to help locate animals and to, um, to talk about conservation of animals and safe driving on the roadway. So this is very real world um, and definitely resonates with students in the middle school. There is a primary focus on meaning. It's all about communication here, all about talking about the animals, what to do, what not to do. Um, so lots of focus on meaning. There's a non-linguistic outcome. We have students having conversations, making recommendations, and then finally coming out with a PSA. So that is the outcome for this task. And then of course, students are using their own linguistic resources, what they're able to bring to the task at hand. So this is a performance task as well, or a suite of performance tasks. So that's a bit of an overview of what it looks like um, embedded in a larger thematic unit to have performance tasks, both summative and formative and also comprehension checks. So let's revisit the goals for this session. We've talked about a lot. By the end of this session, we hope that you are now able to identify the elements of the world language assessment continuum. We hope that you can identify the features of performance tasks. We hope that you can identify types of performance tasks and how to assess them. Also to identify the place of performance tasks in the instruction assessment feedback process, and ultimately to be able to analyze sample performance tasks within a thematic unit. And with that, we invite you to post questions in the chat and we're happy to continue the conversation. So as we're waiting for people to enter those questions, I want to thank our presenters, Dr. Joanne O'Toole, Dr. Lori Langer de Ramirez, and Bill Heller for another enlightening workshop. A reminder that pre-registered attendees will receive not only their certificate within about 24 hours, but a workshop digital badge, which we hope you are collecting. The recording of this webinar will be made available in about a week on our website on the professional learning webpage in particular. A reminder that registration forms for the next two monthly webinars are also available on our website. 